Okay, so... It should work again, you could uh, try again. Good, thank you very much. So thanks to Carlin uh, inter intervention here, the project should be, should have been resurrected and uh, please try again and let me know if, if there's still a problem. So I'm gonna spend, uh, I don't know, probably 15 minutes or so. It's fine. Okay, perfect, thank you, thanks Carlin. Please give a feedback to the staff. Yeah, uh, uh, we're going to spend probably at least already 15, 20 minutes to discuss questions which I have uh, received from you, which I think are of global, of common interest. So one of them comes from somebody here from the uh, Institute of Professor Miller at ETH Zurich. It's about uh, some computation dealing with large geometries of uh, bones, bones that are scanned. I've worked with uh, Professor Harry Van Lente for, for many years and many, actually at least three or four PhD students in the past. So I have really quite a bit of experience with it. So what's the problem? Uh, you know, typical pictures from the, from the left side here after an injury and, uh, and then the model on the uh, computer side. Now, because the geometry is uh, computed by, actually, it doesn't matter that it's computed on multiple compute nodes because the output is a unique mesh, and that's actually a very good point. It's a unique mesh of hexahedral, hexahedral cell, because, but because it's so big, I have written a parallel interface to read the, from the HDF5 data to extract separate pieces, so separate set of hexahedral cell to put on different processors. The problem, okay, you look at the picture from far away, you, 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 and you think, oh, everything looks good. And then when you zoom in, you see this line over here. That's an, and then you see another one here. And you see another one here. That's an artifact. That's the processor boundary, okay? So here I'm using Paraview on multiple processors. And, and even though the hexahedral cell touch each other from one processor or the next, uh, Paraview thinks that they are, Paraview thinks that they are uh, not touching because the ID of the vertices on both sides, left and right side of the boundary, the IDs are different. So how do we resolve this? Uh, we resolve this with uh, actually, this is an explanation of why is there such a problem. Uh, the parallel reader is here. So this would be one way. Yesterday we had somebody ask, can we, this was you, can we change the order of subdivision instead of doing a, ra a, a round robin fashion in X, Y, and Z, can we do all in one direction? This is exactly what I've done here, over here. Uh, processor zero, processor one, processor two, etc. So we read the data. We do the parallel surface extraction. We do the parallel smoother. And then the, the image generation. And this, what the smoother does, it kind of shrinks the surface a little bit. So I don't know if uh, I have a picture here. Uh, no, I don't. But, okay, but anyway, I said that I needed ghost cells to resolve that particular boundary. So I need to add something to this pipeline, and right here at this level, I will add the ghost cell generation. So this is very convenient because I now have a very efficient algorithm in Paraview which can reconstruct ghost cells, uh, and it works both for structured, actually, uh, I wonder if we could use it for your problem as well. Uh, I will have to try. It works both for structured data and unstructured data. 
But doing this, OK, first step, we add the ghost cells. And then to make the shading nicer, you know that I've already said yesterday, we need surface normals. The, normal, the vectors that always point in the direction perpendicular to the, to the surface so that we can do smooth shading. So we add our surface, our generate normals. A filter over here, and we can get some nice shading, like in this particular image. Now let's look back at this problem over here. And let's go back, actually, a couple of slides earlier. OK. We execute the reader once. We do the extraction, the smoother, the image generation. Then we add the ghost cell generation, which means the parallel reader has to re-execute a second time. And then we do the, the generate normals, and generate normals has to re-execute again because it triggers the need for ghost cells. So the student here was telling me, oh, it's very slow to process all this because uh, you first implement the reader, and then you keep adding things uh, incrementally to your pipeline. The solution to this is to make it execute only once, triggering the execution of the reader only after having told, uh, only after having given Paraview all the necessary information. So you do this via a Python script. That's the only way to do it. Your Python script must have a clear description of all those different stages, including the generate normals. And it's only at that time that you trigger. And at that time, the reader already knows it needs to create ghost cells, and it does it right, right away. OK? That would be the, the solution. So I summarize. You prototype this. Then you write a Python script, which does this in the proper order. And it's very important in your Python script, if you save this visualization from if you say save state, the state will have intermediate, will have each of those filters in your pipeline. And for each of those pipelines, it will have a show command. And you must delete those show commands, because those show commands trigger intermediate re-execution of the, of the pipeline. What is important is that you have a single show here at the end of the pipeline, OK? This is really specific to, to ghost cells, for example. Uh, and this is, this is fine tuning of the Python script. This is something where I have a lot of experience. You, you please do not hesitate uh, in the future to send me questions. You, you find my, my email on the CSCS webpage, and you send me a request for help to fine tune your, your Python script. I think that's. Sorry, just a picture. I understood. So each time you have a comment in your Python script, it triggers the show. Yes, yes, it does. It does. Um, because the way, you, the way you use Paraview with the graphical user interface is that every time you add a filter to the pipeline, you click Apply. And by clicking apply, you trigger the execution of the, of the pipeline. So for example, you would open the file, and if you would say apply. This would show already the grid. You would add this module, and you would click apply. It would show again that object. Third stage, you would put the surface extraction. And you would click apply. So the comments in Python script is like apply in the graphical uh, The equivalent to apply is actually something else. It's called update pipeline. OK, that's a very good question. I will show you now uh, 
a piece of code from yesterday. Okay, yesterday we looked at the large uh, data provided by NVIDIA for my example, the raw data set, which had a size of uh, 2048 by 10,024, 10,024. And I used that command called update a pipeline information. And I said that this command corresponds to the first pass in the execution pipeline. The first pass is where the, s the sources advertise the data they are capable of producing. They, here, the reader object says, I have a grid of size n by n by p. And I'm waiting for the rest of the pipeline to tell me what I should do. So, update pipeline information is the first pass. And then we have the extract subset. And if you recall, we only used one slice to that volume of data. And then we said show. Show is like saying, it's a little bit ambiguous. It's also like saying apply. But if I wanted to execute, the point is, the point is this. Show, the command show, requests an image. And by definition, requesting a refresh of the screen triggers the execution of the pipeline, okay? If I wanted to, uh, instead here of only advertising the data without reading it, if I wanted to read it all, I would replace this particular command here by only this part, reader update pipeline. This is exactly the apply button. Okay, so you have to make the distinction between, here I'll, I'll just uh, show it to you in this form, there, there is two possibilities, update pipeline information, and you can do both actually here, it doesn't hurt, because the first one doesn't cost uh, nearly anything, it's just the first pass of the execution pipe, whereas the, 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 second, pipe, the second instruction forces the full reading of the grid. All right. Uh, now you would ask, why, why was this necessary? It was necessary because otherwise the extract subset would not know really what, what, what to deal with. It, it, it wouldn't know how many day, uh, the size of the data set available. So, here, I'll just put a comment on it. So this was the first, this was the first uh, thing I wanted to present. Another one, there was a question from another person about resampling data. Uh, and in fact, I have, uh, I have an example here that I can read. I can make up any example, actually. Oh, my good. Okay, when I start Paraview, with 
a particular source of data here's a block of data which I can color in this particular fashion here the grid type is uniform rectilinear okay over here and I have 8 million cells good uh, suppose I create a second one source of the same type there and I will simply displace it by a little bit okay there I have two blocks of data surface colors there we go somebody yesterday mentioned the filter merge block and then again this morning I talked with uh, another student and they we said oh maybe we could merge because we have multiple blocks together we could merge them together it would be very convenient yes it would be really but the point is we're going to run into big trouble doing this both exam both objects here are, are of type re of of type regular cartesian grid i'm going to select both of them and i will use the merge block which I cannot do uh, so I will use the append data set ah okay here I will append them I will append the data sets And the point I wanted to show is this. We had two structured grid of 8 million nodes, and the resulting data is made of 16 million cells, and that looks right. What is completely unfortunate is that the type of the grid is unstructured okay and this is something you have to be very careful with in visual, visualizing big da large data there are filters which will change the type of your original data and when you go from structured to unstructured it means that some filters will not be available anymore or it also means that some visualization techniques will be a hundred a thousand times slower when you apply it to unstructured grid instead of applying it to the same data in a structured form so if something becomes really slow in your pipeline this will be the first thing to check as the, ch as, the, as the type of data changed. All right. So uh, please remember this. This is very, very important, the type of data uh, that you are dealing with. Now, so this was the append data set. Uh, there's another way. So now from this append data set, I have available a and a search a resample that's not the one i wanted actually i want to use a resample a to image all right so there again i will change the type of the data 
uh, with this, let me zoom on, on, on this feature here. Because this filter is called resample to image, the final output will be of type image, which means Cartesian grid. It will be, it will be strictly near, and that's very, very good. And we will use that, by the way, for volume rendering. And then here we, we have the option of, se of setting the sampling dimensions. So if you had, for example, a point cloud, or if you, if you had two grids that are next to each other, but you're missing a set of cells in between, you'd like that to be one large grid, you can resample them with that, with that algorithm. And this algorithm is fully multi-threaded, so your advantage is to run it on a single node, and it will uh, really use the, uh, all the cores available for that computation. Of course, it will depend on the sampling. The performance will depend on the sampling dimensions. Is it interpolation? It will, it will do, uh, I think, by default, uh, a trilinear interpolation. If you, want to do, if you want to do a different type of interpolation, for example, for SPH data, you have an SPH kernel specific interpolation available, uh, but then it becomes quite expensive. You have to tune that very, very carefully. So there is this resample data. And I think that gives me uh, a good background to continue this discussion about data type for the volume rendering uh, lecture of this morning. All right. OK, we're going to do something that should be pretty easy uh, now until coffee time. Let's see if I can manage on making it simpler for you. We're going to talk about animation. So this is our day number two, and we're going to talk about Paraview keyframe animation. OK. And oh my gosh, uh, I had it right. So we're starting on page 116. All right. We're going, go, we're going to go through the multiple, those multiple examples of doing spatial navigation, OK, to move the camera inside a particular volume, to do time animation, and then to combine both of them. And on chapter 7 of the Paraview Guide, there's also quite a bit of information that you should refer to. Now, when we start prototyping an animation, the first thing to do is work with small data. Okay? So anything that, is, anything that is expensive, forget about it. Otherwise, it would be just too frustrating and too, too cumbersome to prototype your animation. So what is what is uh, low resolution data? For example, if you have a volume of a grid, a volume of data, you could simply do a slice of it through that data, and then perhaps only the outline of your grid, just to give you reference in space. And that, would, that perhaps is enough to give you enough spatial cues to move around the volume. So the animation view is a particular menu in Paraview, and that will give you access to creating those multiple frames. So here's the example we're going to work with. And there will be an exercise uh, with this T part. So we go from one, one keyframe to the next, et cetera, and then to the final, to the final point. 
and we're going to animate through this in a smooth manner. Okay? So keyframe animation is really like, it works really like this. You have to define particular points in space. You have to define a point, a focal point, that is the point where you want the camera to, to look at. You have to define the position of the, of the camera itself and the view of vector. And in parallel view, we'll do a smooth interpolation around it. Now, in the animation, in the animation track, which we will create, I will demonstrate that in a minute, we have four options. One of them is orbit, and that's probably the simplest one, and, it's actually, and it actually works really nicely. If you have a single object in space, if you say orbit, it will automatically create a nice spherical uh, or circular path around that object. This is not a straight circle, and it's, uh, it was designed to be uh, a little bit more interesting. Follow path will uh, give you the, uh, the possibility to do exactly uh, this uh, type of motion. Follow data is an option that is very interesting when the data that you are animating through time actually changes position. Remember yesterday the example of the, of the can, the aluminum can that was getting crushed? Well, the position in space uh, was, was changing. The global, position, the global position, for example, was getting shrunk to the bottom. If we wanted to keep that always at the center of the screen, that would be, that would be perfect to use that uh, follow data option. And then interpolate camera location is something that gives you complete freedom to put your camera anywhere in space. All right, so I have a set of Python script here, which I have copied to the animation folder on the Pitsdaint uh, directory. And I encourage you to copy all of those I will demonstrate them here, and then you should copy them to your local uh, desktop and try them out. So first one will be to create six empty keyframes. Those are the keyframes over here, okay? For each position in space, we're going to create those keyframes. The second one will be to modify those six keyframes as you like it, really. I mean, it's, you're not going to break anything. You can put the camera in different position in an arbitrary fashion. Uh, this will be uh, that particular uh, script. Then we will have to save the Python script. The difficulty currently with Paraview is that when you save your state in Python, the, and it, there's nothing about animation. It's just not implemented. So I have implemented that for, for my own use, and I'm happy to share those, those uh, modules with you. They come very handy to be able to save. It's pretty rudimentary uh, Python code, but it's just there to fit my purpose. So we will use that uh, uh, save keyframes Python script to, uh, to adapt our, to adapt our uh, animation script. And then when you have your animation all done, then you are free to turn all the special effects, special light, special coloring, etc., that you want. For example, turn the ray tracing on, and there's also a script here that does everything. Still, as part of the exercise of this morning, the, the T part is actually uh, here two pieces. There is the bottom, uh, the body of the T part here, and this part here, the lid, is another piece, okay? Is another object altogether. So the, your exercise will be 
to set up this animation and at the same time the animation proceeds through all the different frames I want you to change the transparency of that object and it's not don't imagine this is difficult uh, the, the user interface gives you access to all those uh, all those things second example that you should try is use a particular object and keep it at all times centered on the screen and that example of the aluminium can which you find also uh, on Pete's Daint uh, in the animation folder uh, will be perfect to exercise that particular feature. Now, we, we've briefly mentioned that yesterday. When you have a movie to save, should you do it in batch mode or should, should you do it in an interactive fashion? Interactive really should be left to prototype your animation. And furthermore, if you save an expensive animation, it, doing it in an interactive fashion would tie up your client uh, on your desktop for, for as long as it takes for the movie generation. So my advice is to really quit this completely and then do everything in batch mode. And if I were to execute the first Python script to set up the viewpoint like this, do the final one, retrace the uh, uh, setup, the retracing setup, and then save animation in that matter. All of this, all, all of this in one batch mode, then I would render my movie at high resolution and in batch mode. This would be left as the final exercise, okay? Then we're going to combine spatial and temporal animation. In the, in, the, in the Python script which you see created, I've put in two different options. One of them is commented out over here. It's the scene play mode. By default, it's sequence, but you can also change that to snap to time step, which means that Paraview will synchronize the camera motion. So when the camera moves, the camera has a time associated with it. It will synchronize that time with the time of the simulation data. So it's capable of interpolating your data to bring in the new data as well. And really, it's just a matter of a single line, changing a single line here. So that large animation of the, the shear layered convection that you saw yesterday. I prototyped that. I had a thousand time step. I prototyped it with one single time step because the grid itself didn't change. That was the advantage of it. So it was a single volume of data with the flow going through. So I could prototype it with a single time step. And when I was ready and, and absolutely 100% confident it would work, but that wasn't the case. I had to redo it at least 15 times. Uh, then you switch this, and it starts loading all your data. And OK, there. So exercise will be this. Create an animation. The default is time 0 to 1 around the teapot. So you have the teapot, and you look. You look around like this, you move yourself around. And I want those last images here, starting at 0 0.8. I want this, I want this to be the final image. So there's a little disk of radius 0.15 centered exactly here, facing in the plus x direction. That gives you all the details you want to put up that little disk. So I want you to load your tea, the teapot, create this disk exactly here, you, then you'll have it on the screen. And then you'll understand what my animation is. So I want to start here. I want to go around like this and back through, flying through that particular, uh, the handle here of the teapot. 
This is exactly the picture I have over here. Okay, this will be your exercise. And I have solved it because I, I made that picture. Okay, so it's, it's not difficult. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven points to set up in your animation to make that happen. All right, so uh, demonstration. I will demonstrate that to you, and then you will do the exercise yourself. Uh, there we go. So part of you. I can't. Script equals the first one is I forgot. Yes. Thank you. All right, so there's my teapot. There. I've put a plane at the bottom of it because it's always nicer to have I don't like things floating in the air like this. Things should always sit somewhere. Furthermore, when we're going to do this with wet tracing, we want to put a nice reflecting floor to make it shiny. So we'll put a plane on it. There's my teapot. And you can see that I have two objects. One of them is the lid here. And the other one is the body. Uh, oops, the body is right here. Okay, very good. My view animation is right over here. And for the moment, as you can see, I have no... I have no... Um, no camera animation. Basically, this Graphical user interface lets us, lets us add multiple cues for the animation. And I mentioned changing the transparency of the lid. Let's, let's just do it for you. It's, you'll see that it's very simple. So here I select the object that I want, the lid. And each, on this particular list of objects here, I will have all the objects from the pipeline. So you can, you can do something with those objects. There we go. And on the lid, I have the opacity <coughs> track to add. I type plus. And now I've created over here a track with a little ramp which means I have a linear interpolation of the variable opacity for the whole duration of the animation. So I should be all set to go here. I have, I'm going to change this to 300 time steps. The default time is zero and it goes all the way to one. And let's try it now. Uh, I have to say play. So unfortunately, there I have to go like this. Can you see it? I'll do like that. Let's start again. There, it's fully transparent. And when I play, it starts showing up. And then I can stop at any time. And here I have a cursor, OK, which I can move back to fine tune my animation. All right, so that's the key principle of doing animation. We're going to add here as many parallel tracks, and each of those will change something in the animation. It will change the viewpoint. It will change the characteristics of the object, etc. So let's put a rotating orbit around the, uh, the teapot. 
if you look at, at my, uh, my menu here, I go to camera, and I say orbit, and I say plus, and I say OK, and let's try it. There we go. I'm already rotating, orbiting around my teapot. Of course, I'm a little bit dangling like this because I didn't take very, I wasn't very careful in setting up the view up vector. If you wanted a nice clean uh, animation like this, it's possible to do. Let's do it right away now. Let's do, let's do a, here you will have, okay, there's X. If I go to my animation view, like that, I will cancel, the, cancel that camera and I do a nice clean camera. And here now you see that the normal is perfectly pointing up, zero, one, zero. So if I say okay, and I play, there we go. I have now this nice, clean, simple orbiting or animation. Yes, question? So what's the difference uh, in this uh, pop-up menu between origin and center? So, uh, so the, yeah, so the, uh, so I'll, I'll get to this. In my animation track, over here, for each animating object, I have something I can edit. So if you move your mouse cursor in the middle of this uh, white rectangle, we can specify further the animation. So the first example I will take is change this animation of the transparency. Instead of going from zero to one, I want to go from one to zero. You'll see that it's very simple. I double click on over here and it tells me that I have a ramp going from zero to one, I can, change, I can change that to one and zero and say okay. And if I go back to now to my time step zero, I am fully opaque. And if I go to the last time step, I am fully transparent, okay? So that part worked. Now I answer your question. I go back to, I go to the orbiting a Q over here, I double click, and now I have all the characteristics of my animation, and watch carefully what I'm doing. I am moving away those particular panels. Let me see, let me do, let me do it a little bit different. I want to zoom a little bit further. Come back to my animation view. And this shows you exactly the orbit, okay, around your teapot. Now for each of those points, I have here the so-called camera position. I have the camera focus. So this is the, the focal point here at the middle of the teapot. And then the last, the last thing to select is the view of vector zero, one, zero. So that's the vector pointing up. Did I answer the question completely? Uh, let's look again. I don't understand the question. Ah, this. Yeah. You're asking what this button does. No. 
Yes? Yes? Yes, send an origin. What's the difference? Ah. Well, the origin is the yellow dot on the circle. Yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, it, they're the same names. It's unfortunate. What is called center here is later called the focal point. So that's really the center of the orbit. And then the origin, I would guess that the origin is the first point on the orbit. Okay? And we can verify that. Here we have a minus 7, 49, 118. Let's say OK. Double click again over here. And sure enough, the, the position of my first point here on the orbit is that origin. All right? And please notice that you have a button here closed. So you can close the orbit or you can leave it open. This would be, this is a hint already for your exercise uh, to make that animation and then to go through the handle of the teapot. All you'll have to do is take this. Instead of closing the orbit, you'll have to stop at the last point and then take this point and move it inside the handle and then more or less you're done. And then you're going to see some interesting effects, and we'll explain what those effects are. So here, uh, you can, mod of course, modify exactly. If you want the position of those points, you can click on any of those values and modify them. You can also, this is why it, at times it gets a little bit cumbersome because See, I would like to manipulate those points. And I have not found a way yet to, I really have to go, go, go away like this. Go back to my animation view. There we go. This is where it's nice to work on multiple screens. I have two large screens in my office so I can spread the graphical user interface where I want. There's one point here, look. I can take that point, I can modify it in space, okay? And as I modify it, the graphical user interface over here also changes the position of that point. So there, I can modify it any way I want. Mm. See, that was the first point on my orbit. The last point would be over here. And here, again, I have the plus button, so I can add more points to the orbit as I wish. If I say play now, there is my play. So it's kind of slow. And the way you should do it is adapt the animation here to the number of frames. Another thing that makes it very slow here in this animation is that I was changing the transparency at the same time. So my advice to you is to tune one thing at a time. When you're done tuning one parameter, you turn it off. You tune the second one, and then finally at the end, you combine all those elements, and then things are a lot faster. So if I were, for example, here to disable momentarily the opacity uh, animation, if I say play, see, it, it is relatively faster. All right, so we stop with this. Here we have our animation. If I say save state, and I, I go to a, to a Python script,
there's my script and there are there's the reading of my teapot, the lid and the body, etc. And you can look anywhere there's nothing about animation here. It's all lost. So this is why I created this uh, Python script which you can run here, which says save keyframes Python, which, which is called save keyframes in Python. And it writes, that, it writes that particular, and we're going to look at those. We're going to look at the detail of this so this is the code I write. I get my animation scene. Here you are welcome to change the number of frames to anything you want. There's the option here to go from sequence to time animation. The queue mode is path based. And there's one keyframe with the view up vector. There's the path to all the different, all my different orbit, orbital points. And this would be the Python code that you paste at the bottom of your Python script. And if you do that, without any other modification, it will read it back. So I, I will demonstrate that to you, in fact. So there, there's Paraview. I will, queue, I will queue, quit, sorry, and I will concatenate this to my script. And read it back. And I have my animation just like I wanted. OK, so all those Python scripts are there for you to take for the exercise and to also take home to play with next week and to use for the rest of your experience with Paraview. Until I, it's, on pitch date, I have put a directory called animation, where you should find all those scripts. Is that not true? Yeah. It's in slash, in the scratch, in my scratch directory. Uh, let me verify that with you. Scratch pair of you. Aha. Uh, okay, it has uh, momentarily disappeared. That happens in the computer world, as, as you know. <laughs> Make the animation, OK? And I will copy those. SCP pi to daint. Sorry about that. Animation, there we go. OK, I think we will now. So I'll, I'll, answer, I'll try to answer this. Let's go back to my presentation and see if we are synced to do the exercise. And then we'll stop the video. So yes, we are indeed at the last time step. So this will be, we call, this will be your exercise. Try to do an animation with the lead of the uh, teapot and with Something like this. And if you make something slightly different, doesn't matter. What is important is that you learn the particular tools available for, for animation. All right. So.